It's very telling that uh, bourgeois propaganda around Stalin and the Soviet Union always comes back to this idea that Trotsky was the true uh, Marxist and that Stalin was this uh, usurper who just came in and stole everything. It's kind of funny that the anti-communist, anti-socialist propaganda from bourgeois establishment aligns perfectly with the Trotskyist propaganda about and disinformation about Stalin and the Russian Revolution. Iranian nuclear weapons development. They have turned the island into a communist hellhole. The experiment in Venezuela has failed completely. Interesting clip from this documentary about the aftermath of the Russian Revolution, post-revolutionary era. Again, 1917, the Bolsheviks successfully take power in the Soviet Union, they overthrow the, the Tsar and later the provisional government of Russia. Stalin was a key leader of the Bolsheviks from day one, very dedicated. Trotsky joined the Bolsheviks like what, a few hours before they won, you know, opportunistically and something that is important to mention. So just to give, you know, if you're new to this, if you're, if you're new to the history of socialism, basically, Throughout the early 1900s, Stalin was a key organizer of the newspapers of the Bolsheviks, an activist. He was especially active in an area known as Baku, which today is modern uh, Azerbaijan, which is an oil-rich region of Central Asia. And it was actually one of the first areas that was invaded by the British imperialists after the Russian Revolution, the Soviet Revolution, because it is very wealthy in terms of natural resources. Stalin organized a lot of workers, especially oil workers in that region, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Georgia, the Caucasus region. He was very familiar with the working class there, but also in Moscow and Petrograd. And up until that point, Lenin, Stalin, the Bolsheviks, they were organizing. And eventually in 1917, the Russian Revolution is victorious. So this is this clip now is after that after the revolution is victorious uh, and the death of Lenin and how Stalin becomes uh, one of the leaders of the Soviet Union. So we're going to play this clip and uh, we're going to delve into this question that Trotsky is supposedly in mainstream media is portrayed, or even the Trotsky is left, that Trotsky is the real heir of Leninism and that Stalin just snaked his way into power for, for glory. The conventional Marxist intellectuals looked at Stalin and they dismissed him. They just had no idea of how much uh, uh, Stalin could do. Because he admires his organizational skills, the job Lenin gives Stalin is an administrative role, the general secretary of the Communist Party. Nobody else wanted the job of general secretary. The general secretary's job seems quite a boring one. While Trotsky and Kamenev strut the political stage, it seems Stalin is assigned menial paperwork. He is left working in the background while they take all the glory. But it's not long before he realizes that in reality, the general secretary holds the key to power. A secretary decides who is going to come to the meeting, who's going to be told about it, what's going to be on the agenda, the new Soviet Union is run by committee. If you control the agenda, you can control everything. Gradually, he controlled appointments. And by controlling appointments, he could put his people into various committees. And if you could get a majority in the center committee, you were the number one man. While Lenin and his top team are distracted by all the problems of running a country that has been downtrodden for years and just come through a civil war. Stalin 
builds his power base and bides his time. All the while, he plots his revenge against the snobbish intellectuals who dismissed him. If you made a point of, of humiliating Comrade Stalin, your days were numbered. There is no question about that. In 1924, Lenin, the unquestioned leader of the revolution, dies of a cerebral hemorrhage. Stalin is among the party leaders carrying Lenin's casket to its final resting place. But one important person is not there. Leon Trotsky. The general secretary hasn't invited him. Stalin sends the wrong date deliberately to prevent Trotsky turning up at the funeral. And because he didn't turn up, what sort of Leninist could he be, this man who doesn't turn up? With Trotsky absent, it falls to Stalin to deliver the eulogy. To thee, great Lenin, we owe all that we have. To thee, great Lenin, uh, we dedicate ourselves. To thee, always to thee, great Lenin. A way of saying, I am your heir. Very interesting clip. Trying to slander Stalin, making it seem like he just kind of sneaked his way into power. And it's I find it so fascinating that these bourgeois, old, dusty academics are basically siding with Trotsky. If you pay attention to the clip, if you pay attention to it, they never slandered Trotsky. He's protected. He's sure they'll take a few little slaps at him, but almost never do they slander Trotsky the way they slander Stalin. I find that really fascinating how they sort of protect Trotsky. They say that he was working in the background, plotting all this language, right? Again, like painting him as a criminal, painting him as somebody who is just looking for power. I think what I find really interesting is tying it back to what Dust was saying earlier, that, you know, they talk about bourgeois academics and snobbish intellectuals. And Stalin was somebody who was had a lot of contempt for these bougie intellectual ac uh, academics. And it's, it seems to be the recurring theme that in a lot of the slandering of Stalin, they make it seem like it's just about him getting revenge, when in reality, Stalin understood that in order to popularize Marxism, you have to bring Marxism to the fields, to the factories, to the nations of the East, to the working class, the oppressed of the oppressed, and make it practical to them. Uh, maybe, Dust, if you want to share some thoughts about, tell us about you know the difference between Trotsky and Stalin, their approaches, right? The Trotsky soy academia, liberal, cosmopolitan versus the Stalin working class approach. And I also want to shout out uh, Jenny Lin, who said uh, that fake Stalin is pretty hot, to be honest. <laughs> um, Stalin is somebody who I think in general was somebody who was demonized as well because he was somebody who represented strength and masculinity. And I think in a lot of the liberal postmodernism, people try to downplay that as as bad. So, dust your reaction to all this and some of the differences between Trotsky and Stalin, and why Stalin is the real heir of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Right on. Um, I really like that you brought up my uh, my my tweet or Facebook status earlier. Um, Stalin brought Marxism out of the European cafes and into the 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 the, um, the factories and the fields of the east and a lot of that a lot of what um inspired me to make that um tweet was i know it would get a lot of hate from the soy latte trotskyites <laughs> but um in reality why i put to the east not only was um stalin you know came up with very humble origins from an oppressed nations you know, and that's and you're, I absolutely loved your um, um, how you made an analogy between like a Chicano um, coming to power and and um, leading the United States to to socialism. Um, it's that would be similar. But um, a lot of people don't know this. But Mao, um, who, you know, was who loved the peasants, um, worked with the work with the peasants, served the people. Um, 
before the success of the Soviet Union, um, you know, it was it was popular at that time for those organizing the peasantry to study anarchism and Kropotkin. So Mao had like a Kropotkin book club. And through the success, through seeing the, the vast industrialization, through seeing a change in the country, through seeing an improvement in the material conditions of the people, Mao was inspired to look into Marx and Marxism and Leninism. So not only did he take, you know, um, did he take what did, you know, Marx came out of an academic environment. Um, a lot of the people that followed him were in academic. I mean, um, I was a little harsh purposely to try to get that reaction with that post because, you know, Mao did, I mean, Marx did organize workers and you also right. have Lenin before that. I per but um, I think Stalin took it to a whole nother level. Stalin mm -hmm. made the tool of Marxist Marxism and Leninism a reality um, of the working masses in Russia and inspired China um, today, which is is having a lot of success and over overtaking imperialism um, in a lot of ways. Um, I thought that that video was kind of funny it had the it had the the bad music you know like don't don't do something bad's <laughs> going on and you could tell like like oh they're going to show this to university students and stalin thinks you're a a, a a snobby intellectual and stalin is like all those working class people that picked on you um back in high school or, <laughs> or whatever kind of right. appeal to that uh trying to manipulate academics to be to be against Stalin, um, <clears throat> yeah, and then that bit about the general secretary, like nobody wanted to do that job, but he was going to do that job. I wonder why they made him do all the paperwork. You know, what I'm trying to say, <laughs> coming from an oppressed background, but right. you know, you know, it is what it is, and then somehow he manipulated that and connived. And it's that. So not only is he willing to do work, nobody wants to do. He's willing to connect with the people. And if you defy the interests of the people, he'll put you in your place. And we need that. Um, we definitely need that. I, I've had to do it a few times. Yeah, definitely. And I think another thing that's important to make a distinction as well between Trotsky and Stalin is the differences in the theory. Trotsky promoted this idea of permanent revolution, which when you hear that, it sounds cool. It sounds beautiful. It sounds revolutionary. But when you're talking to average working class people who don't want war, who don't want permanent chaos and instability, it's fucking crazy because permanent revolution was essentially saying that we have to wait until there are revolutions in Germany, in England, in France, in the Western European industrialized capitalist countries in order to begin building socialism in Russia and the what is to, what was the Soviet Union. And it's something that was very opposed by the work, Russian working class and the working class of Azerbaijan, Armenia, so many other places that were in the Soviet Union. And what it essentially advocated for was just non, no economic development, no stability, and I think it's something that when people look back at history, especially Russians and in and, and the former Soviet Union, the Stalin years were the most prosperous, peaceful, successful, because there was rapid industrialization. There was peace. The people were protected. They had all of their basic needs met. If you constantly are at war, you're going to tire out your base. You're going to tire out the people and you're going to lose the faith of the masses because Everyday working class people experience poverty, chaos, violence. They don't want more of it. And I think this is something that especially a lot of the ultra Maoist types don't understand is that when you're building socialism and, and you're in a country, your job is to keep the lights on, keep food on people's table and keep a level of peace. Otherwise, if you're constantly telling people we have to intensify war, we have to continue going on the offensive you're going to lose people. And Trotsky is somebody who is just an academic writing about this, traveling, and is somebody who is disconnected from the everyday working class person in Russia, Georgia, and, and all the all those areas. 
Whereas Stalin with socialism in one country, it sound when you hear that, even the phrasing, right? Uh, permanent revolution versus socialism in one country. Obviously, permanent revolution has a sexier name, but socialism in one country is the correct line of Marxism Leninism because it's saying we don't need to wait on these Western European countries to build revolution. We can start building revolution here in the East and begin to build political power for the proletarian class. And that's exactly what happened. We had Mongolia, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Russia, all these places that for many years, the second international and the first international never thought would be at the forefront of revolution. They were initiating that. Eventually, we know China as well, uh, Korea. And I think it's something that is opposed by a lot of ultras who just kind of fetishize permanent war, permanent violence, permanent chaos, and also by people who fetishize the liberal Western academia, cafe lefties. So I think it's um, it's something that's really important to mention, the, some of the ideological differences. Uh, Comrade Flame of Liberation, your thoughts and reactions to the portrayal of Trotsky as the legitimate heir of the Soviet Union and socialism and how documentaries like these brand Stalin as just a power hungry leader. Yeah, it's very telling that uh, bourgeois propaganda around Stalin and the Soviet Union always comes back to this idea that Trotsky was the true uh, Marxist and that Stalin was this uh, usurper who just came in and stole everything. It's kind of funny that the anti-communist, anti-socialist propaganda from bourgeois establishment aligns perfectly with the Trotskyist propaganda about and disinformation about Stalin and the Russian Revolution. Um, furthermore, uh, if you look at the fascist states, what they promoted, fascist Italy actually promoted Trotsky's works to try and uh, delegitimize the Soviet Union and propaganda against the Italian communists to try and say, oh, the Soviet Union isn't really Bolshevik, it's not really communist, it's uh, Trotsky was the true one, and what Stalin's doing, he betrayed their own revolution, blah, blah, blah. And the Nazis as well, uh, I don't know if they went to quite his extent, but they said similar things like how uh, Stalin had killed the revolution and so on. It, it's very telling that not only like liberal bourgeois propaganda, but even fascist propaganda utilized Trotsky uh, against the Soviet Union. Uh, and as far as the so-called world revolution versus socialism in one country, um, well, first of all, they had attempted uh, this so-called world revolution policy, or sorry, permanent revolution uh, versus socialism in one country. Um, they attempted that, uh, and it's actually it's actually a ridiculous concept of what what it actually is the term sounds good and it's it's a positive term but the actual what it actually means was insane the idea was that we would the idea being okay we soviets we're not going to build socialism in one country in our country because you can't have socialism in one country so what we're going to do is we're not going to have socialism here we're going to have a highly authoritarian uh form of what they call like war communism and ex use the military to export the revolution elsewhere. And they attempted that in Poland, and unfortunately it was unsuccessful. Poland was, there was the Soviet-Polish war, and it was not successful. They were unable to spread socialism to Poland. Um, on top of that, there were uh, socialist revolution attempts uh, throughout Europe, um, in Hungary, in Germany, in Italy, and they unfortunately all failed. So the question becomes between so-called permanent revolution and then socialism in one country becomes, well, is, does this mean because the revolutions in the West failed that we have to just pack up everything and give up the idea of socialism and just wait for a better time period? No, that's not what you do. Stalin and the idea of socialism in one country is not at all against the idea of world revolution. It's just the practical application of it, which is that, okay, the revolutions, unfortunately, they have not succeeded in the West, but we can't just pack up everything and go back to the czar or some liberal capitalist government. No, we have to hold on 
and defend ourselves and do what we can to also promote or support revolution abroad, which the Soviets did. They supported Spain and China and elsewhere. And eventually it was absolutely proven without any doubt, no one could claim or try to argue that socialism in one country wasn't successful in spreading world revolution because shortly after World War II and the, you know, Stalin's policies and everything, socialism was spread to all of Eastern Europe into Central Europe, Poland, East Germany, uh, all over Asia, um, China, Korea, Vietnam, Laos, um, as well as uh, the Middle East, our world, a little bit later on into the Cold War, but you had socialist and pro-Soviet governments later on in Iraq, Syria, Egypt, Libya, Algeria, Yemen, then throughout all, all across Africa, you had socialist and pro-Soviet governments later on, and then Cuba and Nicaragua and so on. This is much later on, but the point being that this is a continuation of what Stalin did with building up socialism in the Soviet Union as a stronghold for socialism. So it's, it's a, even the terms, it's, it's a misnomer because socialism in one country, it wasn't this idea that, oh, we are only going to have socialism here in one country. The, the idea is for now, we have control of our country and we're going to build up socialism here for now. And when we can, when the time is right, we will support revolution internationally and support those forces. Um, so it's, and it was proven to be successful. They attempted Trotsky's policy. It was a failure. Um, now another important thing, this is my view on Trotskyism. Uh, I think while I think it's important to answer to the myths and the lies and why Trotskyism is false and why Stalin is true continuation of Marxism, Leninism and practical and correct, uh, uh, form of Marxism, Marxism, Leninism. But I think while, while that's important at the same time, I don't think we should sort of imitate the Trotskyists and sort of be like um, mm. so strong against them because on one hand, you know, answer when they attack Stalin, we answer and explain why they're wrong. But at the same time, the Trotskyites, uh, the worst of them, all, what they tend to do, like you, you talked about in your experience, they had this meeting on socialism and what is it all about? It's about attacking Stalin. It's this insane <laughs> thing where that's their whole thing. Instead of attacking capitalism, they're spending half of their time talking about how evil Stalin is. Um, yeah. So I think on one hand, uh, we should avoid that, but at the same time, be able to answer these things and, and answer, explain why Trotsky was wrong. Um, and when I say that, I also want to point out that, uh, you know, not all Trotskyists are the same in all fairness. I think Trotskyism is wrong altogether, regardless of which form it is. But some Trotskyites are definitely, some Trotskyists are definitely a lot better than others. Um, especially in the context of the left today, there are some, some of the few people that like still hold on to like class instead of like the ID poll are old Trotskyists, like the Socialist Workers Party, they've gotten, they've gotten really bad in so many ways. But in a lot of ways, they really hold on to the class struggle politics. And there are Trotskyists like that, where even though we don't agree on the Soviet Union and Stalin and stuff, when it comes to practical things, we could actually agree on a lot of things because they haven't been bought off by like the liberalism. So there are better Trotskyists and worse Trotskyists, in my view, not all Trotskyists are the same. Uh, Trotskyism is incorrect overall, I would say, and Stalin and Marxism Leninism is correct. But I think it's important to make that distinction there. There are some better Trotskyists. And of course, a lot of the Trotskyists are just horrible pro-imperialists, you know, like the ISO and these other Trotskyists that support every single U.S. intervention, every single so-called revolution, you know, the overthrow of Gaddafi. Um, anytime there's like an attempt to overthrow a socialist, anti-imperialist government, they're behind it trying to give leftist arguments for why you should support it. So there's different types. And I think Trotsky, while Trotskyism is wrong altogether, we shouldn't get too caught up on fixating on it in the way that they fixate on Stalinism, so-called. Um, yeah. But at the same time, we have to be able to answer why it's incorrect and why our position as Marxist-Leninists and people who uphold Stalin is correct. And 
just one other thing is that um, Stalin to this day, is not only is he extremely popular and loved in Russia and the former Soviet Union, in China, his portraits, you could find his portraits everywhere. Uh, in North Korea, they study Stalin. In Vietnam, in Cuba, Stalin is upheld as uh, a great leader for socialist revolution. And throughout the Third World, uh, during the Cold War, Stalin was viewed by the national liberation and socialist movements as a hero. You know, um, Kim Il-sung, Mao, Ho Chi Minh, um, the Arab socialists, Saddam Hussein, um, they all, Che Guevara, you know, all looked up to Stalin as a great hero and a great fighter for socialism and world revolution and how you could build up your country from nothing into being such a strong power because of with socialism. Yeah, most definitely. By the way, for those of you who are listening, we're looking at a picture of Lenin and Stalin in China. And that's what I found really interesting. When I traveled to Asia, I've been to uh, China and to Bangladesh, and I never saw any portraits of Trotsky, but I sure did see a lot of portraits of Stalin. So I find that uh, really interesting. Uh, I love what you said, uh, Comrade Flame of Liberation, that we shouldn't focus on just opposing Trotskyism, like we should critique it, but then just move on. Because when whenever your whole ideology is based on what you're opposed to and what not what you're for, then it always throws people off. It always ends up not being attractive to the people you actually want to help. And I think one of the best comparisons is tr between Marxism Leninism led by Stalin and Trotskyism. It's kind of like Stalin is kind of like that popular guy who throws a party, throws a great event, and everybody's at that event, everybody's having a good time, everybody is enjoying themselves. And Trotsky's like that guy outside of the party who's like, hey, everybody, fuck that party. I got kicked out. That party sucks. Don't go in there. And it's like, dude, what are you doing outside of the, the house party still? Like, why are you still here? You know, and, and their whole identity is just based on opposing that instead of building your own thing and doing your own thing and and just out defeating your your supposed enemies by deeds. And I think Stalin is somebody who was a man of his word, a man of deeds. And he even says that himself, that in order to prove a theory right, you do you just carry out the deed in real life. And I think that's really what Marxism and dialectical materialism is about is understanding the scientific method right you remember in elementary school all of those different steps of the scientific method and testing out having a, a thesis and then a hypothesis and observation experimentation and in many ways the science of revolution is the same thing where you try different things right even in china there was a trotskyist section in china and shanghai that attempted to try things the way trotsky advocated for them they failed ultimately mao and and the strategies of Marxism, Leninism were victorious in China. But that's sort of the approach that we have to have, where you try out different things, you see what works, and you adjust your ideas based on what works, not just based on whatever dogma you have. And I think Stalin is somebody who definitely upheld that scientific understanding of socialism.